What did I tell you? Is that not the most incredible film? Um, I'm really, really excited to bring out the writer-director, Alex Rivera. This is his first feature film. His next feature film is a documentary scripted hybrid set in an immigrant detention center called The Infiltrators. And it won the Audience Award and the Innovator Award at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. And it's going to be released at the Lemley Theater in April of this year. And then I'm going to try and bring it to the hammer as well. Um, Rivera's work has been supported by the Ford Foundation, the Tribeca Film Institute, the Open Society Institute, and many others. And he's going to be here in dialogue with Curtis Marez, a professor of film and ethnic studies at UC San Diego. His most recent books are Farm Worker Futurism, Speculative Technologies of Resistance, and University Babylon, Film and Race Politics on Campus. So please join me in welcoming Alex Rivera and Curtis Marez. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. It's nice to have flowers. Uh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, you know, I've been talking with Alex for a long time, uh, have admired the film for a long time, um, and I want to ask you uh, to reflect a little bit about, uh, you know, where you were then and where you are now. Uh, the film still feels incredibly fresh, uh, but it was released in you know, 2008, and I know that you were working on it, developing it for years before then. Um, and so there are a lot of issues that the film takes up that uh, uh, it seems prescient. Um, and so I'm just curious to hear you think about, uh, yeah, you know, what you were thinking about in 20, 2008 and now. So, you know, one of the things that I most uh, like about the film, or one of the images I like the most is uh, the frogman. Um, and it seems that one of the things that the film does is really present a compelling representation of border militarization. Um, so what were you thinking about in 2008? And, and how has your thinking maybe uh, uh, changed since then? Yeah, sure. So thanks, Curtis, for doing this. And thank you, everybody, for sticking around tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, so in terms of like then and now, first of all, like then was, was a giant window of time. And what I mean is that the film was conceived, uh, the sort of first spark of it came to me in 1997. And then it took 10 or 11 years, really, 11 years, uh, to get from like that original germ of an idea all the way through script development and you know financing and production and to premiere the film in 2008. So even in the, the window of time between sort of originally having the idea and then getting the thing on the screen was a giant, uh, a giant window of time. Um, and, um, you know, where I was when I had the germ of the idea in 1997 was, um, in the 1990s, you know, and the 1990s were a time frame kind of similar today in certain ways. Um, there was a lot of anti-immigrant hysteria, a lot of it emanating here from California under Pete Wilson. Um, there were vigilantes on the border. The first pieces of border wall were being erected under Operation Gatekeeper, one of President Clinton's initiatives. Um, and so there was this kind of anti-immigrant hysteria on one side of the screen, and then the other was the sort of dream of the global village. Um, enabled by kind of the internet. Even though the internet was dial-up modems back then, uh, the dreams were really big. And there was this vision of a kind of planetary conversation and a, and a world in which you know information and capital could kind of flow freely. And some of that embodied in the, the rhetoric of free trade and NAFTA and globalization. And so there was on one side walls going up, and on this other side, this rhetoric of um, connectivity and sort of freedom. And um, so trying to figure out where does, where does I, where do I fit? Where does my family fit in that uh, contradiction? And, um, and really, you know, where we're at now, I mean, I think that that contradiction has really proven to be a sort of central thrust of history over this past, you know, these past 20 years in terms of uh, immigration becoming this kind of third rail of politics globally where it really seems to be sort of what the nation state can offer to its citizens around the globe is it's what we can offer to you is 
to keep them out. And that's kind of the main thing that so many of these kind of like authoritarian regimes, including our own right in this country, are offering is like, we can put our boot on that person's neck and um, without, um, you know, and so, so in any case, I mean, um, it's just been interesting to watch that 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 uh, that 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 fracture just sort of rip open over over these these years. Um, there's more to say. I mean, I guess that the last thing I would say is that the project also, because it was set inside of thinking about the internet, was I think an early expression of internet cynicism or criticism of the digital promise, and a lot of that critique, which even in the film is left kind of suspended. At the end, you're le meant to be left thinking, does the internet open up alienation or solidarity? We don't know. And the way the plot is structured, it kind of leaves you sort of on the fence. But right now, I think we're living in a moment where we're, people are really seeing the alienation, the surveillance, the kind of dark thrusts of the capitalist internet um, pretty clearly now. Like, it's a lot more clarity about the, the problems of it. Um, and those of really emerged over that, that time frame um, much much more so than when when the film was conceived. No, that's, that's great. I mean, the, the, the figure of Luce seems to be a kind of, um, you know, prescient figure of, of what the internet is going to look like and what the, the ethical concerns are going to be of sharing other people's stories and fictionalizing their stories or what have you on the internet. Um, and also just, you know, what you said, it just seems so amazing. I remember that 90s moment of anti-immigrant, uh, border vigilantism, et cetera. But what's so striking about Sleep Dealer is it's imagining a world in which the border really is closed. And I just can't remember a moment uh, until this moment when, when the current president was saying, I will close down the border, that, that what seemed like speculative fiction is, is part, of our, uh, a part of our reality. Um, but a kind of related question I had uh, was about drones. So uh, you were really um, the first person I remember, uh, artist, scholar, whatever, who really put drones on my, my cognitive map. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really thinking about them until I encountered your work. And um, uh, things have changed since then. Not only has there been an expansion of military drones, but all kinds of you know more or less uh, cuddly friendly consumer drones, uh, uses of drones in filmmaking to do different kinds of uh, aerial footage, what have you. So I'm just curious, what you what were you thinking then? What are you thinking now about drones? Sure. Yeah. So for me, I mean, the as I mentioned, the the the, the project started by thinking about. Um, well, I'm not sure. I did mention it. The 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 original seed of the idea was the remote worker. It was like I was looking at this panorama of border walls going up and internet transgressing them, and thinking, what does this offer my family? Maybe my family's future is a world where uh, folks like my cousins who've come to the U.S. to work in factories and restaurants and landscaping. What if they stayed on the other side of that border wall and, and telecommuted to America? And that was that was the like. Psh, whoa kind of moment of the whole, that was the beginning of the process. But then once that's your protagonist, and, and then you start to develop the antagonist and start to flesh out the story world around that image. But in that image is, is a couple things. One is it's like a kind of summarily Marxist perspective on labor, alienation, um, the idea of in the profit motive when you 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 your 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 life your energy is expressed through your labor turns into dead labor turns into a commodity that has a value which is the value of your labor plus something else right and and that the kind of alienation of labor um, taking a unique form in the digital moment where labor can be packaged and transmitted. Um, and expressed through a machine. And so what is that? Is that dead labor? Is it living labor? Is it undead labor? But to sort of, it's basically dronology. It's labor at a distance expressed through a machine. Um, and that image came to me by thinking about the reality of how undocumented folks are situated in our present political discourse or in the discourse of that time. Present but absent. Working but meant to disappear. Very much here and yet erased, right? That kind of state of unbeing. And so then when, when that was the beginning of this science fiction story, and that's gonna be the protagonist's condition, when I started to think about the antagonist condition, I was thinking about, well, if our characters projecting their labor from south to north through this matrix, 
Maybe the antagonists should project their labor from north to south. But who labors in the south? What, what, what emissaries does the north send to the south? I thought about tourists. I thought about executives. And then I thought about the military. And in terms of just writing a story, say, oh, if you can have the, you know, if, that, if, if the, the military component seems like very interesting. So I started to work on a sort of telepresent military antagonist. And this was in the late 1990s. So this is before drones had really started to populate the, um, the, the popular discourse. That, that really happened after around 2003 when the first drones were weaponized in, uh, in the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but so before that, but I was just in this sort of science fiction writing mode thinking about that, that disembodied telepresent antagonist. And that's where the drone fighter came from. And also, um, there's permission given through science fiction. I was reading um, lots of cyberpunk, Neil Stevenson, uh, Joseph Haldeman has a great book, uh, Forever Peace. Joseph Haldeman's a Vietnam vet who writes about his experience in, in the war through, um, through the metaphor of drone, you know? Um, he doesn't call it that, but he has like, uh, in Forever Peace, his, uh, He's a his character. The character in the book uh, controls a remote war-making machine in Costa Rica, <laughs> of all places, from a from a from a networked battle station in Houston, Texas. You know. So, anyways, so 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 partly so science fiction, ingesting science fiction, cyberpunk, and then just thinking about, uh, like I say, this kind of like Marxist-inspired uh, narrative that I was building, and uh, yeah, so there it came, and then. Um, similarly, I just think the state of disembodiedness, um, that the, the digital, you could see it coming and it's, it's, it's here, you know? And so I know like, I don't know if it's happening here at UCLA, but I know in Berkeley, they've got these little, uh, robots on campus now that deliver food. And, uh, when the, the robots allegedly drive, uh, they're self-driving, uh, until they get to an intersection that they can't figure out how to cross. And then a worker in Colombia in South America controls them. The kid who developed this company is from Colombia, and so he's been hiring the workers to control these food delivering robots that are in 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 works in, in, in factories in Colombia controlling them. But um, in any case, there's lots of uh, examples of companies using this idea of human intelligence to kind of augment and supplement artificial intelligence. There's lots of examples of companies doing that now. Great. No, and I, I recently saw a very cheesy B movie called The Drone, uh, where it's one of these little consumer drones that like delivers stuff to you from Amazon, but but it kills you, like it uses the blades to kill you. And that was just interesting to me because I mean it's the cheesy version of this, and your film is the much better version of this. But but I just see all the ways in which drones are are kind of normalized, you know. So I've seen like you know an asceticization of 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 drones, and so it's a good reminder. You know your film that there's that uh, that murderous edge uh, as well. Uh, okay, you know again uh, uh, what we were thinking about then, what you're thinking about now. One of the big themes uh, in um, uh, in the film uh, that you know people uh, I think have justly celebrated the film's representation of labor and the way in which you talked about um, the whole plot about water is so prescient and important and opens up onto questions of climate change and and what have you. So I'm just thinking, what were you thinking then? What are you thinking now? Yeah, I mean, so the overall like kind of logic of the film is pretty much just everything is for sale. Um, absolutely, everything can be commodified, and and will be unless some force prevents it from being commodified. And so, you know, if I could have figured out how to have a scene about air being for sale, I would have put it in the movie. But other than that, like pretty much everything is is com you can turn it into a commodity. And so. What I was thinking about was um, the true story of Cochabamba, Bolivia, where water, sort of famously including rainwater, was being privatized. In reality, this was happening. It was a company based in San Francisco named, I think it was Bechtel, is the company that was there in Bolivia trying to privatize the water and faced incredible popular resistance and they got chased out. But Nestle and lots of other companies have not faced that kind of resistance and have successfully commodified aquifers and uh, you know all around the country and around the planet. So, I mean, that was pretty much the the documentary kind of impulse behind thinking about that, and then wanting to have a 
a backdrop for Memo. Uh, Memo as a migrant, knowing that this was going to be a story of immigration, not wanting it to be driven by his personal dreams or desires, but that there would be an amount of uprooting and kind of a destruction of his ability to stay put. That I think, knowing from my own family and just from working in immigrant communities, that that's always there, that, that these communities, they don't come to the US. They, the US was already there. That they come from a historical continuum that our, company, our country, look at this. Time for the sequel. We'll put up the sequel. I don't know. Yeah, but anyways, that's it. You know what I'm saying? That that was what I was thinking about. I feel a little. That's great. Yeah. No, and I, I love that scene where where Memo's in the the money transfer scene and 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 the water's everywhere and and he's in that baby blue tracksuit. I just think <laughs> there's something about the baby blue tracksuit that is 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 gorgeous and aqua like and, <laughs> and what have you. So uh, it, it seems like maybe we should open the the floor up to audience questions. Does does anyone have any? Uh, questions for Alex? Hey, Alex, how's it going? Um, in regards to uh, shooting in Mexico, um, I'm going to assume that you shot most of it in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed the atmosphere, especially the the señoras, the, the the men, the women, just the look, everything. I'm going to take a guess. I mean, a lot of them weren't professional actors. They're just people you asked. Is that right to say? Yeah, the act, the, 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 the leads were all professionals. Uh, you know, Jacob Vargas has had a, a long career and, and um, you know, uh, Anyways, you lots of movies. I mean, he was in Selena. He's in Next Friday. He's on. He's on TV now on the Netflix series. But he was on the TV series Colony. I mean, Jacob Vargas has been acting for a long time. He played Rudy, the drone pilot. Uh, Luis Fernando Pena was in a. Uh, has also had a long career in in, in Mexican TV and film. He was in. Um, a telenovela called Fuego en la Sangre in uh, feature films like De la Calle and Amarte Duele. Um, and Leonor Varela had been in, um, she, back at the time, she'd been in Voces Inocentes, a, a really beautiful film by Luis Mandoki, and um, Blade Two with Wesley Snipes. And, you know, she, but so anyways, all the leads were cast through agencies and um, had were working, you know, working professionals. But then a lot of the, the bit parts were, you know, new actors and community folks and standard passers-by that we recruited and all of that, so for sure. We filmed, if you're interested, we filmed in um, everything in, in, in Mexico. Um, the, we, did, we shot for seven, almost seven weeks. It was a se uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, six and a half, no, seven and a half, six-day weeks. We shot for 45 days um, in Mexico City, in uh, Querétaro, and in Tijuana. Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you. That film was, it's genius. Um, second of all, the, sorry, I just saw someone that I know. Um, so <laughs> you shoot a scene where the father throws a rock to the dam. And when I saw that scene, I teared up. Um, and you show it twice. Can you talk a little bit about what that scene means, and well, yeah, that's sure. about it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so thank you for bringing it up. It's it was. Uh, I mean, um, I have like mixed feelings about the film. I have to say because there was like the dream, and then there was like the madness and the insanity of trying to make that dream come come true, like through physical production, and it was like incredibly difficult, and a lot of things got lost along the way. Um, but one of the things that was challenging between like the dream and the reality was blowing up the dam. Like it, you know, once somebody told me, anytime a dam appears in a movie, it's because it's going to get blown up. Um, <laughs> that's. I just saw Frozen Two. I have a kid, and I, I there's a dam in the movie, and I whispered to her, "It's going to get destroyed," <laughs> and it did. You know, <laughs> that's the only reason to put a dam in a movie, by the way. But um, but. <laughs> but once, like, for the reasons that we discussed, we'd had this idea of, like, water being this kind of uh, multi-layered 
or, or multi significant element in Memo's backstory and in the town, and that this would be the the mission at the end when the characters kind of entered into a conspiracy together and to 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 destroy the dam. Um, but when we went around talking to visual effects houses about actually doing it, I learned that it's a, at that time. This is two thousand and six, so fourteen years ago. It was really hard to do visual effects with water. Uh, they didn't have the CG power to make digital water back then. And then, so you, if you're talking about a physical mm, dam, building a model of it and blowing it up and photographing it, um, water doesn't scale well. So like a mini dam with mini with water, you photograph it, it doesn't look right. You have to build like half scale or quarter scale to make it look real. So we were just really stuck. And so <clears throat> for me, one of the wonderful mm, potentials and powers of the scripted form, of the narrative form, the fiction form, is you go inside the character. You can work inside their memory, inside their perspective, inside their mind. And so I decided that's where we would go for that moment. So in the beginning, you see Memo's dad throw the rock at the dam, and it's just an expression of his own frustration with obviously how his life has changed. It's not subtle if that's what it is. But then at the end, um, when the when the missile is is shot at the dam and the the Death Star is about to get blown up, right? Instead of seeing it happen literally, we go into the memory, and and let the rock do it and do it in in sound. And I was, so I was happy with that moment as a writer, thinking, okay, here's a challenge. We can't blow this thing up visually. We just don't have the resources. Um, so what can we do? And so to make it into a kind of memory and the idea that the hijacked drone would uh, fulfill the longing of the rock thrower in, um, in, in sort of global politics. The, rep the representations of all of that I found devious and powerful and good um, and weird. And so anyways, th that was that, that's where that all came from. Thank you for the film. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the, um, I guess it was supposed to be AI, but the um, her interface's um, decision not to let her edit any of her memories or kind of um, not be true to what it actually was. Because there have been a lot of studies that have been done that said memories are highly subjective and they change over time. And we edit them ourselves. But so I don't know if you were trying to touch on like a commentary and at, and again, it's very prescient because I feel like with all the algorithms telling us what to buy or telling us what we want to, we're supposed to want to buy based on, you know, is it's the same thing. So were you kind of touching on, yeah, how we, everything will then be objective and nothing will be subjective. There will be no selective memory or revisionist history of any type. Like, you're going to have to be true to it and machines will hold you to that. Or, I don't know, were you going somewhere Beautiful. else with it? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so sort of like the way I talked about scatting out the protagonist and the antagonist, and once I had this kind of like worker and soldier character and I knew they'd be in you know connected by this by this killing right by this attack and then I knew that the story would be about kind of how do you put them in dialogue and came up with this idea of a writer uh, a journalist and in the early drafts she was like a normal journalist but then I realized wait I have this technology of the the body machine interface shouldn't what if she was a journalist from the body and I was also thinking about basically back then when I was writing this in the late 90s, blogs were starting, they were kind of insurgent. But just from like, again, a sort of economic analysis point of view, if you have like 100 bloggers that are writing sort of for free and going to just be writing because th they have their motivations. And then over here you have the New York Times. And the New York Times has like staff, they got to be paid, they need health benefits, they have an editorial committee. Um, which is going to be the kind of swarm of people that's going to sort of take over in the public consci consciousness, the people that are sort of limitless because they're kind of swarms of them writing for, for free and kind of putting tons of information out there, or this other sort of slow-moving, methodical, expensive organization. And so my analysis was like the bloggers would win the day. So this is like a future without kind of that... Um, you know, where the sort of institutional media was reduced or diminished, and there's this kind of s 
you know, sort of vast ocean of information. But I had in my plotting, I was like, I want the soldier to pay the writer. I want her to get paid to go do this work, and that's going to be her motivation to go and and exp get to know this guy, and that's going to be the kind of um, the sin or the what do you call it? The kind of the complexity of it all. And so, who? Why would you pay? And then I had this idea of a, in a world where like everybody's blogging and everyone's kind of barfing up information <laughs> into this vast <laughs> void. Maybe people would pay for certain information that was premium, and what would make it premium would be that it was like somehow truthfully, truther, tru more, more truthy. And uh, so then I had this idea of what if the computer was administering a lie detector test? And so anyways, by that point, I'm off kind of on a limb and kind of it's pretty weird. And I, I don't really think of this as like a very concrete speculation on the future. But I think the idea of like dialing into the network effect of lots of people participating in this kind of information vortex and, you know, the veracity and the kind of slipperiness of like, reality, that's what it was meant to be a comment on, not so much like the actual whether or not our memories are really true or not, but just having some fun with those questions about in a world where reality has become kind of un reality as presented through the media has become kind of untethered because there's this plethora of voices. Maybe veracity becomes like a premium and so she gets paid a little extra to submit to the machine. You know, and that was the, the sort of fun of it, though. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, this film. It's been really uh, instructive, <laughs> really helpful in my scholarship and in teaching. So this is a great film, and thank you for it. Um, to this question about Luce, um, I think that what you're describing is really prescient for social media and authenticity. So it doesn't get called veracity, but selling authenticity to an audience has been theorized in new media scholarship. Like authenticity is really significant for being able to capture an audience and performing that authenticity and all these different content creators trying to achieve authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, Hmm. But I wanted to ask this question. I, I know from the commentary of the DVD that you have this relationship with Luce as a documentary filmmaker of selling people's stories, or not selling people's stories, but the negotiation between industry, audience, interview subjects. And I wonder if after this big budget Hollywood film, if you think of the filmmaker in a different kind of way, or if that metaphor still kind of holds, or how you feel about the documentary filmmaker in this kind of way, kind of following Curtis's template of then and now, right? So if Luce was the documentary filmmaker, does uh, post-sleep dealer Alex Rivera feel like more cynical or battered or even more that way about, you know, um, telling other people's stories? No, I mean, I think that the, the problem that, that Luce kind of falls into and that <clears throat> You know, as a kind of exaggerated version of what I what I felt myself as a sort of politically committed documentarian and and a person who comes from, I'm definitely not as privileged as some people in our society, but I'm more privileged than others, and I've, you know, chosen chosen to use some of that that privilege and power that I have to to try to tell stories about people who've had a you know a different life than me and a, usually like a sort of harder life in a lot of ways and so um but then there you are on a grant from the ford foundation or whatever with a two thousand or three thousand dollar camera in a in a home of somebody who that camera is worth their annual salary and you're there and what is that it's kind of it's 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 sort of fucked up and kind of uncomfortable and complicated but alternately like staying in brooklyn and making commercials for nike it's worse, you know, like, so I think it's more comfortable to do that, but I'd rather do this, you know, and so I, I think that the, you know, I just went through a process with my partner, we just made a new film called The Infiltrators, it'll be out in theaters in about a month, um, and, you know, this film has been an incredible uh, <clears throat> example of the ethical, um, complications of documentary practice in a variety of ways. Um, uh, it's a longer longer topic, but but I think that the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the ethics and, and, the, and the questions about how do you be a socially committed storyteller are 
inescapable and I think will be haunting me for my whole life, and I hope they do. You know, it's just, I think, and if you're asking those questions about yourself, then I think it means you're in a good place because if you're not asking those kinds of questions, it means you're in a comfortable place. And I don't think we need filmmakers in comfortable places right now. I think we need filmmakers out in, like, uncomfortable places. Um, and so I expect that those questions are never going to be resolved by me or anybody else, but I think hopefully... You know, we wrestle with them for a long, long time. But I don't know if that's at all helpful. I feel like it's a cheating answer, but I'll do it. Uh, so first I want to commend you on a really fantastic film. Touches on so many relevant topics, technology, immigration, labor, climate change. Um, I'm curious uh, to learn a little bit more about how you see theory as fitting into the creative process. You've mentioned Marx and alienation, but I can also see like Gloria Anzaldúa and Borderlands with him being there, but not there, and ultimately into like an entirely new entity as the film shows at the end. And then hearing now um, possibly potentially issues of like personal experience. And so I'd love to hear more about your creative process and how you see theory and personal experience and all of those things fitting in because it's just a fantastic end product. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. I mean, th I think the, you know, <sighs> You know, there are filmmakers who I think way more than me control the craft of film and the shot design, scene design, <clears throat> everything about it. That's not my strength. But what I've always kind of tried to prioritize was like a, a way of seeing, a way of seeing the world, a way of seeing reality and trying to see generously. Look at um, my first film was about largely about my dad watching TV, you know, and <laughs> but I looked at tried to. At first, I looked and I wanted to avoid that. I, I wanted. To, I was making. I was a student, twenty years old, making a college film, personal documentary, and my dad kept watching TV, and I kept filming. It's oh man, when's he going to do something interesting? You know. <clears throat> and then I decided to wait just to stare and like, why is he watching TV? You know. And my dad's from Peru. He was watching Univision. He was in upstate New York. Started to realize he left his whole family behind. He left his language behind. Uh, he left his community behind. He left the landscape he knew behind. And there he was watching this kind of glowing image every night and kind of reconnecting with a sort of a version of home, a transmogrified version of home. And the TV became, in my, my way of seeing, like a kind of portal to reverse migrate or to migrate into a third space, an Anzalduian third zone in between here and there, um, but through the television. and But it was like confronting Guillermo Gomez Peña's work and reading Ansaldúa and reading Stuart Hall and reading, um, you know, uh, John John Berger, Berger um, you know, the film, The Sleep Dealer, the title comes from a Berger's book, um, the, A Seventh Man. John Berger wrote a book called The Seventh Man, which is a sort of one of his sort of meditations, I guess, but it's on, on migration within Europe. And it tells a story of uh, workers who move, walked from Southern Europe to Northern Europe to work, and they'd walk on these trails until they were so tired they were going to collapse and they would rent a bed. And the people who would rent the beds were called sleep dealers. You know? But I was reading the book because John Berger has a lot of insights on migration. <laughs> He's a beautiful theorist. So in any case, to answer your question, theory gives you a gift of a way of seeing the world. And if you sort of take time and try to look with the world at wonder and understand how use theory to sort of see that level below the surface, below what the camera can see, see what's going on a little more more deeply and make, make the movies from there, it's a real gift. And so for me, uh, theory and, and sort of engaging with it as much as I can, I'm not a super egghead, but I try to try to try to engage with it as much as possible. It 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 offers that that avenue to open your eyes and see something more deeply. And <coughs> so, I want to thank you for the, these really very interesting questions and your eloquent responses, which haven't tried to um, sort of do anything more than you know, respond from where this film is coming from. And on the theory point, um, uh, I was intrigued by um, actor network theory also and how the multi-actants um, in this film were 
um, that is the characters in this film in a sense were as much the rock as it was as they were the growing um, sprouts at the at, at the very end as it was the city um, scape and the materiality of the film was what really struck me um, strongly especially as um, you were uh, and this is from Bruno Latour, um, and and especially as as you were uh, the, the the actor, the multi actant you know, um, interspecies or interbeing, you know, stuff. Um, I mean, this is yeah, this is no less about people for being about all the different actants um, that made the film feel, you know, made it, it enabled me at least to feel into the film, and uh, and I wondered whether. Um, you consciously had that um, in mind that 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 sort of um, that the the landscape and the cityscape itself be be actants in in creating this this future uh, tension. The this links to what somebody said about ethics, and I'll try to be brief. But I'm not a, I'm really a wordy person. I can't help myself. Um, I relate. And um, so. The um, it links to to what you said about uh, one, uh, about you know it being fucked up, um, you know uh, that you're always having to sort of consider this this consumption you know issue, um, and commodification, uh, because uh, th there the ambiguity of the ethics, um, uh, I mean, is what struck me. Uh, the ethical ambiguity is what struck me. I mean, we're always dealing with in a way epi. Ontologies. You made a world for us that was asking questions of itself, you know, um, from inside itself. And I just wanted to say I really appreciate the nuance of, um, on that, mm. on that point. Mm. Ask where you wanted to say something. Beautiful. Well, th thank you so much for the comments. I, I was very happy to hear hear them all. And uh, you know, in terms of the multi actants, and I'm, I. I I've never phrased it that way, but I really dig it. And you know, the um, you know, one of the things we're definitely kind of enjoying thinking about, and we being my co-writer and I, the way that the film was written, by the way, is like I spent about five or six years working on it myself, developing multiple drafts that just couldn't get over the finish line to actually get produced. And then I started working with a, a real friend and comrade, David Riker, who made a beautiful film called La Ciudad in the late 90s. Um, and so he and I dialogued a lot, and he's a real big fan of the milpa, you know, and the milpa that's described in the film of the, uh, you know, the, the 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 true phenomena that when corn and 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 beans grow together, they kind of the beans wrap around the corn, and uh, and also subterraneally the uh, the root systems sort of neutrify each other. They nitrate one provides the nitrate that the other one needs, or but it's like a sort of perfect circuit and a kind of a network, if you will, because the way they they grow and. So the idea that um, that our characters were kind of, you know, building an alternate network, a kind of uh, a mesh of resistance, a mesh of solidarity amongst themselves, um, that could be a counterweight to the mesh of alienation being provided by the, the capitalist net. Um, that was something that was in her mind. And honestly, the hardest part of the film, and I think the most disappointing part for me personally, is the ending. Like trying to figure out how do you escape this alienation if the the vision that capitalism offers in the film of a world where people where workers are trapped behind walls you're born there you stay there you know that's the vision and then we'll use this we'll, we'll set up a network for, for us to extract what we need from you whether it's under the ground in in the in a lake or in your body we'll take what we need and you you know we'll set the and, and the you know for a price and if that's the vision that capitalism offers, the kind of nightmare of a sort of Bantustan globalization where workers of the world are kind of kept in the, meant to be kept in their own pods while free trade kind of runs, runs the show. If that's what's on offer, what's the, what's the resistance? What's the sort of transcendence of that? And the, we came up with this. We had dreamed about like what we called the, I think it was called our Mumbai montage of a, a planetary unplugging of workers around the whole planet, like disconnecting, and maybe that they would coordinate it. We had this idea that maybe on the work sites, because if you imagine the work site where Memo works, let's say that those robots are controlled by a work, one from someone in the Philippines, one from someone in Mexico, one from someone, 
in India, et cetera, maybe the workers would, the robots would develop a kind of Morse code and use that welding tool to write a language on the beams to each other to coordinate a global strike, you know? And so we had thought about that as a third act, um, but we just, it was too much, you know? We just couldn't get there. So this was, this was the, the, the counter mesh the the conspiracy that we were able to like visualize and enact on the screen, but um, in any case, I enjoyed your comments and it's fun to wrap. Thank you. So maybe time for one more question. Hi. Uh, so I work in. Uh, production and post-production, and uh, I just want to say your work inspired me a lot since uh, through college. Oh. Um, so I guess I'm kind of curious about, um, you. I guess you kind of touched about production for this film, and I'm curious how your experience compared to this upcoming documentary, and if you plan on doing an another narrative film again. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, so the, the, the Infiltrators, the film that's uh, going to be released shortly, is actually a hybrid, so it's about, you know, it's pretty much 50% kind of scripted and 50% um, documentary. Um, the idea of the Infiltrators is it's a true story of undocumented youth, kind of dreamers, that do activism and they want to stop deportations, uh, and the, but the way they decide that they can best stop deportations is if they get apprehended by the Border Patrol on purpose and go into a detention center where then they can help other people get out. And so we filmed with the real people when they were really doing this on the outside, but then when they turned themselves into the Border Patrol to go into detention, then we, turn, we depict them as an actor. And so they go through the space of the detention system pick up the phone and call the documentary on the outside. So the two layers, the kind of doc layer and the scripted layer kind of run parallel in simultaneous story time. Um, in any case, so there, there was about a 60 page script there and um, s between Sleep Dealer and now I've been, um, I directed a series of like music videos and short films and I've had the, the pleasure and the privilege of working with a crew a few times with Sleep Dealer when I showed up on set, I had a, it was a 100-person crew, um, and it was the first time I'd ever been on a film set, pretty much, basically. Like, I'd never worked as an AD or a script supervisor or getting anyone coffee. It was like, I, I, it's a longer story how I ended up there, but it was um, incredibly overwhelming and, like, s wonderful and a great opportunity and stressful as hell. And I fainted, like, two weeks into production. It was like I lost 20 pounds during production. It was like a whole psychedelic journey getting this thing to happen. Um, uh, infiltrators, I didn't faint, you know what I mean? And, and I think I had a lot more control of the whole visual um, apparatus. It still was ultra low budget, so it was, like, you know, coverage that I wish we could have gotten and things we'd... But, like, we did something, like, for example, in Infiltrators, we carried a steady cam for the whole shoot and no dolly. Um, and so that was interesting. We, the, the, camera, the, mo the camera moves a lot more in Infiltrators. There's a lot more um, sort of, I think, sophisticated choreography between the actors and the camera. Um, I'm, I'm prouder of Infiltrators in terms of its, like, scene design and, like, visual design. Um, but um, but the ideas of Sleep Dealer still kick ass. So that's like, so I've, I'm hoping to do. I, I, to me, the Sleep Dealer is kind of like my life's work, and I, I, I'm interested in revisiting it as like either a TV series or a remake or a sequel or something like that one day. And there's been some uh, attempts to do such a thing. Um, I think it'll happen when the time is right. But um, but anyways, yeah, that's it. But thank you so much for your comment and your question. And, Thanks everybody for hanging out, and if anyone wants to talk, I'll I'm, I'll be just chilling around here for a little bit. So thank you so much, and thank you to the museum. Thank you, Hammer.